Sorry guys, listening here is nice. Yeah. <laughs> it was a really good night, it was very inspiring. A little bit different from the other startup events, so that's uh, really nice. Comment about sort of uh, intuition and sort of seeing where the ball is going without seeing the ball. Uh, it's really one of the key sort of um, one-liners and sort of expression on tonight. I think that's really, really spot on what entrepreneurship is all about. Uh, tonight was awesome. Really, really awesome. I uh, had a great time. It was really cool hearing the story and I'm so glad that uh, Startup Grind is here. Let's give a big, huge Startup Grind welcome to Mr. Lars Henrik Fries Mullen! To brainstorm around the businesses, everybody gets engaged, everybody's co producing the ideas, the solutions, etc. It's never been that I had the brightest ideas about how exactly we should organize everything. I think, if anything, that catalyzed, being the catalyst of getting together with other bright, well, hopefully those bright people and me, uh, <laughs> we could sit together and create the, the great solutions. And everybody felt they were part owner of the solutions. I don't know, it's different for everyone. For me, it was very natural to take on the risk myself, take on the funding, financing. I can tell you though, you know, if this is startup grind, and grinding is about, you know, fighting for, for your existence sometimes. I've been fighting, I've been, I've been grinding so much uh, on, on a few occasions all, all over the years here. So, I started, for, you know, by, by myself, ran it there, involved other great people there. I think we all felt that we, we were, you know, creators of, of the ideas there, but I funded it, I took more responsibilities, and those times as entrepreneurs, it, it can be a lot of fun to, to, to own your own company, but when, when there's no cash in the bank and, and you, you started up too many things at the same time, you wish you had a partner too. Or, and again, I was so fortunate to meet with other great people who had a similar idea about how the next generation of employment could be. So I met with, for example, Boris Nordenström, he was at uh, Court before. And uh, Royal School of uh, Technology, sorry. And and he he was there to to help the with the programming. We get some website and yeah. we get an MVP. And look at hell, seriously, it was totally weird. And so that's the way it started. Really. Yeah. So we started to get some kind of a matching website. How were you able to make this company grow? You know, four years from zero to one point two billion. What, what's what's the key to success? Well, uh, two or three things. First of all, it looked like hell in the beginning. We would learn from this. We are out there and trying it again. The client would have just said here. We talk to the clients and they didn't understand what is this all about and we had to change the UX and UI. So we adapted it step by step. And um, then I think we were, and this is kind of amazing when I look back, I don't, I, I can't really understand. Guess how many people we were, like in 1998, we were 20 people, something like that. And then in 2000, one and a half years later, this was a spring, in, uh, what was it, in two years. Guess how many people were two years after that? Yes? Any questions? Any uh, suggestions? 35. 35. No, a little bit more. A little bit more. <laughs> a little bit more. We're like 600 wow. people in, in just a couple of years. And, and this was a hell of a great race with great talented people. So the answer to your question is really that I think we apply the same idea here, that we we hired super brilliant, charismatic, go-getters that were willing to work hard and kick ass. And we were a great, you know, critical mass of team here. We worked late in the evenings there. I don't think any company can be really successful if you don't really, you know, have that kind of work or culture. Like what milestones that you hit have been meaningful to you? Life. Well, meaningful. I think. I think actually that seeing and realizing that that uh, headline was ours, that we we got other people in companies calling in about the survey and the rankings in 1988. That was a great thing. Yeah. I would say also because I think you're going to ask about some problems along along the way also. But I think it was a great um, it was a great time when when we took job line public after we had grown it into be 600 people. 100% a year at least, with revenue increase all the time. 
nothing could stop us really. We, we took the company public. That was a great moment to take the company public. I don't need to do that anymore. Seriously, that's a lot. Really, the process in doing it is. Uh, but uh, thanks, uh, and then um, uh, actually selling the job line business. You may think some of you here, when you have your companies, and and it can be five people employed, fifty million revenue. Look at Mojang. Um, you know, it doesn't matter really what you do there. Or it could be thousands of employees. I think as an entrepreneur, sometimes you think it's tough to let go of companies. But I can tell you, when we sold Jobline that day, mm -hmm. I was so beaten down. I was actually I had bronchitis. Not that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I have sound good. Yeah, and I was pressed from you know every. That's a separate story. It takes too long to talk about. But I was so pressed from so many players. We had you know gotten. Debts in the company, and we had been fighting, and I, you know, had started up some other things as well. So I was in, in, in a lot of problems there. And um, Universum at the time, because Jobline was a spin-off, the daughter company in a spin-off to, to Universum. Uh, Universum at the time also had some issues. This was like 2001, so this was ages ago. But the point is that I was under pressure there, and I got bronchitis by trying to, you know, talk with everybody. And, Calm down the creditors, employees, everyone. And then suddenly I managed to, in parallel there, do negotiation with Monster. And I have no idea how I did that, but I met with the founder of Monster in Paris. And uh, no idea? Like, how you know? no, I, I don't know how, well, I don't know how. I were just there to drink wine and eat cheese. Or... <laughs> I know I, that I did it. I know that I did it. But I don't know how, how I had the courage to do that because I was under such a pressure. It was like playing poker, I guess. Uh, I just, you know, bluffed or, or said that, yeah, and it was actually true, the company is worth so much, yeah. so I don't think you can afford to buy it. It was so much to buy it, Monster, at the time, uh, Jobline at the time. And uh, the stock price at the time was like 10 crowns or something like that, from 70, so it fallen a lot, and that created the pressure there. And I said, this is such a great company, so I don't think you, no, I don't think you can afford to buy this company. Well, uh, uh, so, and, and I just played so cool there. Fake it until we make it. Huh? What? Fake it until we make it. Yeah, a little bit, I guess. Act as it. And then I, I, and here's a pretty good thing. I refused to sell to this guy. I let him sell to me why he should buy it. I said, no, I think maybe you're going to destroy the corporate culture. Are you really going to be able to drive this company into profit? And then I said, and why do you think it completes the monster business in the world? Um, and it was so natural, so by asking the right questions, yeah. I got this great guy to, to say that, oh, we want it because it's completing our European presence here, you're in all the markets that we are not, and uh, we're going to increase our share presence. So he sold the whole thing to me. So, yeah. Mm, uh, is this an NLP? Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit like that. So never like psychology? Never yeah. linguistic program. You, you know, we've all had you know, people trying to sell things to us, which is kind of stupid, it really is. better that they ask the right questions. Yeah. And I have to write questions to this guy, and then in the end I said, well, the stock price now, I think you know, we want actually 45 crowns a share. <laughs> no. And, and I, no, I don't think I would dare to do that, that thing again. I, I guess I was just... Why not? Why not? I don't know. I'm getting, no, 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 not, not, I don't care about reputation. Shit. No, no. Uh, <laughs> I think it's just like, uh, sometimes it's great to be a little bit naive, almost visionary, and just think, God damn it, you can do it. Yeah. And I guess maybe say like in the in the Batman movie, the latest one, you know, where the guy is he has no other chance than to jump for that rope. And if he has no, not the rope, but the cliff. Yeah. And while taking off the rope, jump for it, act as if I'm gonna reach there, and we did it. Yeah. And thanks to that one, I, I we, we sold, we got a great bid, it was negotiated down a little bit in the end here, but we got a super great prize for for job line. Yeah. And that was a great satisfaction because I was under such pressure there, mm. and uh, it was hush hush everything. And one day I was talking to people, including you know former colleagues who were bitching all the mm. time, and I talked to the private equity company that had invested in, in Universum, and they were trying to take away my Universum from me. It's not nice. Why? Because I was under pressure. They said, "Okay, we'll buy it from you for X. We'll take it over now." So this. And at, at this time you were in Paris, during this whole Yeah, and, and, and the weeks after, I was under full pressure there. 
They tried to sell your. They were trying to do something. You tried to sell. Oh yourself. yeah. Oh yeah. They, they, the wow. big guys, they wanted the company. Yeah. They, they saw the, the, the future success in Universal, and rightly so. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and they wanted the company. But I, I tried to say, you know, no, no, no. And I signed uh, one out of two or three documents, something like that. And then I said, I have to go away now. And I went actually for vacation because I needed to rest my bronchitis. Where'd you go? Thailand? No, no, Spain. And, and Benidorm, of all places. Oh. Uh, north of Benidorm. We had a nice little house there. My, my parents were and yeah. in some way, I don't know how I pulled it through, but I, I played the poker with Monster, and these were all people came crashing down on me. And suddenly we had signed the documents, and and in the morning there, in the whatever 25th of May, 9, uh, 2001, people from Doggins in the street again, hello, and expressing, <laughs> oh, expressing started calling me. And that was the only time I was in, in media because I really don't like to be in media, as I told you before. But that was fun, and I was lying there, exhausted, in a freaking wheel, wheelchair. No, something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, like, it felt like a wheelchair. And I was so exhausted, and then people started to call me and said, you know, you're making this much money, or oh, golden boy. And they should just know how hard it has yeah. been, and how much I bought. Yeah. And, and so then I actually went off and bought it full tetra. Or wine and went to Aqualandia and went in all the slides there. Party the whole day there. It was crazy. Only me. Oh, you didn't see anyone else? It was just like, no, lots like, of people were there, but I was the only one partying. Because <laughs> that was a happy life. After all this fighting, it was like you know, the 15th round of, yeah. of uh, boxing. I was beaten up, bleeding all over the place. No? Thai boxing? No, Thai that's the other one. Uh, so I was really beaten down there, and also, interesting enough, you could see who were true friends and not. In those times there, mm. it's amazing, you could sense that people were trying to get a bite of you, or, mm. uh, yeah, it was just terrible, actually, those, those, that time. But, that's why it was such a great satisfaction, too. So there was a big milestone in your life. Yeah, yeah the, the worst day, I think, during my entrepreneurial life was most likely the day, this is kind of, uh, to me, it was kind of dramatic. How many of you here are parents? Anyone? Some of you. And uh, the rest of you, when you have, hopefully, or maybe not, your, your first kid, uh, uh, it, is, it is a very special thing. It's a very special feeling. Uh, and to me, this was, so maybe you can relate to this, it was two years after I started Universal. And I noticed that we had moved, we, we grew too fast and were uber ambitious, maybe. So suddenly I was walking in the, in the this was the, few days before my, my first son was born. I was walking in the corridors, I, I just figured, God damn, we're like 25 people here, mm. everybody's under 25, and we have a margin of negative 25. <laughs> and, and like, this kind of hold, and again, that was also the time that when the banks came and, 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 and pressed and, and stuff. So I came in there, the very day when you have your first child, it's a very special feeling, and I came in, I was uh, remembering that this was very much when I was under pressure from all these things, and I came in to, I was standing there with my son at the window, and you know, it was snowing outside. This was November, and I was like, oh, this, is, this is the way life should be. And I, I came in then later in the day to the office, mm -hmm. and the receptionist, she didn't have that good touch for, you know, I uh, felt or something. <laughs> she said, like, hello, Ars Hendrik, so uh, the union called here, you laid off three people in the wrong way, so you have, <laughs> you have to now pay penalties of something. They claim that 200,000 crowns or something like that. And then the lawyer called about something else, something, and then the bank called and said that they want to pull the loans and everything. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of tough, really, at that moment. You know, <laughs> I almost hate there a little bit. Yeah. Did you but, cry? No, I should not. I, I can cry, but I didn't. What did you, uh, what did you tell her? Okay. The receptionist? I, you know, <laughs> it's not her fault. It was, she was just the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. No, so I walked away there into the office, I sat down and I lied down in the chair and said, okay, what the hell am I going to do now? Again, I was like 27 years old at the time. And, and every, I, everyone working for you was 25 or below? Yeah, yeah, I was the, the 27 year old, everybody else was. Senior guy, kids. everyone yeah. was you. <laughs> very, very senior. Wow. So, and, and again, yeah, that was tough, absolutely. But those moments, I would never, you asked me before, what should yeah. I do if I could have the life day? I would never trade those moments of, of despair, no. of all the great moments of being with my, my team, my people, my, my, my stars, my co-founders, 
in these conferences, sitting and brainstorming about new solutions to the world, mm. and, and, and then seeing them being realized here with, with great people and great talent. I, mean, I would never sacrifice that. For I would never trade. Um, I, uh, you got to pay a few prizes every now and then to have fun. Record point. Having actually three cash squeezes, and it can be good to share that with all of you. So don't do as I do, do as I say. Uh, since I, I had the tendency not to focus in on, on, mm. on just you know, one thing and just harvest on that one, I don't I want to do anything. I started maybe a little too many things at the same time. And um, I had it there in, uh, in 1990, after two years. I had it between the 1996 until 1998 when we started to have the job, I think. Yeah. And that was kind of funny. <coughs> well, actually, it's not funny at all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, uh, amazing though that as an entrepreneur, I, we, I had a partnership with Bonnier and Douglas and you know, I like them a lot, but I did not know basically anything about venture capital between 1996 and, and 1998. So some people actually called me from the VC firms and said, hello, we're from a risk capital blog here and we would like to invest in your company. And I said, risk, I don't want to take any risk. <laughs> No, so this is how it happened literally two or three times and I thought, oh, go away. Uh, so much risk myself because I was bearing every financial burden, every liability, every line of credit in company was on me, and my mother and father in law's risk and everything. So 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 they were some of your that's where you got your finances from, your mother your mother and Yeah, yeah, so so that's my point that there actually, that I didn't really realize this that well, if you actually have a business partner, like 50% or 30% or whatever it was that Bonnier had at one point in the job and Nordic business, they didn't have it in the rest of the international business, mm -hmm. which is part of the long story too, but we're not going to do that one now. But in the Nordic thing, I felt so responsible for everything, so I shipped in money from my mother and father-in-law, mm -hmm. and asked, hey, can you borrow me this? And I asked some other people too, so, hey, Please help me, we need to pay salaries here. Can you borrow me like 100000 or something? Wow. And what I should have done, if you have, just so you learn this now, if you have a pro rata co-ownership, you don't need to pay for everything yourself, which I did all the time, although I had partners. To pay salaries, what are we going to do? Uh, a guy came in there, actually as some kind of semi-consultant, and he told me, Lars, you need to cut down the, the number of employees here with half or something. Because he did the math, and I, I wasn't good at accounting, so he said, well, Damn, I said, no, I can't do that. And I was in, in a trauma almost, like in the mornings. I was lying in, in Fuskestam, what do you call that? <laughs> I don't know. Well, <laughs> you're a crying child. Yeah, like in the bed. I wasn't Maybe. crying, but I just felt very uncomfortable with the idea that I had to walk into the office and lay off people. I was, oh, I can't do that. Because that I said, before, was this no, this was the first time. So I said that to this consultant guy, oh, I can't lay off any people because we're going to have such a bad ambience, it got a bad feeling in the company in that case if you do that. And <coughs> now, <coughs> today I can totally relate to what is happened. but even at that moment I didn't understand it. That, okay, there's no money in the bank, we have a huge salary list there, nobody else apart from me and two other people were selling, you took on too many people, and he said to me, Lars, how to give a shit about the ambience in the company. If you don't do this, you're not going to have a company. And that, oh, oh well, really? <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, then I took the necessary uh, measures there, and I think that is something that too many companies are doing, uh, too many young entrepreneurs. We're all so afraid of what are they going to say and feel, the other people there. You know, tough shit. Sometimes you just need to cut costs because we didn't sell enough. We didn't, you know, we didn't produce enough good things that people felt that they were willing to pay for. We've got to get our shit together. So. So you got to better, if you have this problem, make sure you, you lay off people sooner rather than later. Yeah. And the amazing thing is that, okay, when we had done that, the world was still there, you know, the yeah. earth was surrounding the sun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, hold on. <laughs> is that your universe? Yeah, that's my universe. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the name of the universe in the earth. Yeah. Yeah. It's very good to be the, the creator of the universe. How, how do you find your way out of troubles? What are your yeah, tips and tricks? That's maybe also a, 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 a hopefully good guidance here. I, I run the business too long without any good advisors. I, I ran it for like 8, 10 years. <coughs> then I met with two pretty good people, really. Uh, one is Joan Brennan today, uh, the venture partner at, at Camden, and mm -hmm. then uh, Henry Kicklin, the CEO of 
each year. Yeah. And I listened to them a little bit more, and they actually brought in some money in the company. This was 1999. Mm -hmm. And um, and that they helped me to understand this thing with the, the dangerous risk capital. I mean, they let me talk to, to those people. And then we packaged the company, we spun it off the job line business, and that became a very valuable company. Yeah. So I think having guides or, I mean, mentors, really, yeah. coaches and mentors that you can totally trust. And, and listen to them, and really try to listen to what they say. Because this is maybe also then something with back coin, with, with, with uh, the flip side with being an entrepreneur. You think you're so fucking good. You think you know everything. Well, actually, you don't do all the time. Listen to some other people. And um, that is, by the way, one more uh, good tip for the future. If, if you can find, not, I think every every startup entrepreneur should work like 110% mm -hmm. of the time with, with sales. Yeah. That could be also online sales. I mean, work with A-B testing then, UXSEO, just try to get the revenue in there. Mm -hmm. But then also spend 20% more time also, on top of the 110% <laughs> on, on trying to find great partnerships and great distribution channels because you get right. leverage from that. And I think when we did the different businesses, me and Boris, it's been when we got the one year on board with the job line, when we, we had the Vodafone thing, I mean, Campus Mobile, when we started that one, and we grew like, Hell, I mean, we grew so much there, and we had a partner in Vodafone then. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's always very good to have a par partnership with a sales channel like that. Right. And that's what I'm recommending these young entrepreneurs, especially she's coming from the companies like Barna, Spotify, and some of us, which we've all heard about, is that they, they don't think just that they're going to stay in Sweden. They, they, they take it out there quick, as soon as possible, just like we did with Jobline. And as Universum is doing now, we're just into our 30th market now. Wow. And, 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 you know, like, we, we, we don't go for just saying, oh, according to the general affairs, we have to be reasonable when we set our targets. Yeah. You know, we, we need to be, you can only grow with 10% a year or something like that. Yeah. Fuck that. You can absolutely grow with 30 <laughs> to 70% a year if you have the right mindset in the company. Yeah. And if you have the right talent. So that's, again, why Universum has put such a focus on really hiring great talent mm -hmm. and people with different skills as tech. Now we're starting a very exciting secret project very soon. Mm -hmm. tech. I'm not going to say anymore. Uh, and, and then uh, we're great, getting great people on board. That is what Spotify also did. I mean, yeah. getting super people, talented people on board. Yeah. The greatest sales people, the greatest talent in, within tech. And that's what you're going to do. I heard, I heard that like Spotify as well as iSell, for example, they have a lot of good storytelling people in the companies. Yeah. Graphic designers, uh, I mean, Scandinavia and Sweden are known for. I agree. For for graphic design, being able to, to make things simple and easy. Yeah. yeah. So that's something that, that you know startups should focus more on. I think Canadian. so. You know, it's interesting because both uh, to simplify it a little bit, but, but you know, the Japanese design <coughs> and, and it is it's influencing both you know Apple and, and I think Scandinavian design, especially Danish design, is very good, and there's some. Some features in, you know, when you do great UX on the yeah. website, but it's minimalistic and it's really cool. At least when right now it's very good. So I would say we have a great opportunity. And you know, when I come back, every time I'm back here in Sweden, I just love it. There's so many brilliant, talented people here, and not like caught by, by the old thinking that you cannot do this, but really ambitious and want to do kick ass and getting inspired by, by Spotify and Florida and Universum and, and others. And there are so many great things that can be done out there. And, I think all the, the young people can, can get things done. Seriously, when you compare the United States mm. to, to Sweden now, the tax system and, and running a company is much more complicated in the United States. Huh? Yeah. You're a startup? Oh, yeah. It's sick. No, seriously. You have to file like this many papers. Mm. I think everybody is really, truly, as a human being, you're some kind of an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur mm. in yourself. It's just you got to free your mind and, and realize that you are you're a, 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 a better night than you talk about. Some people feel that they're <coughs> subjects, that they can affect the future. They are in the distance, or they feel that they're objects, and somebody else is in control of their future. But I think that every entrepreneur should feel, and, and do feel, that they can affect their future business. Yeah. And here's the key. We are all, you know, intuition is actually the sum of lots of experience in the back of your head. And uh, it's so fascinating. I would never have been good at finding out the intuition that Donny Lee had, that there should be something like a little list there. He almost saw the UX in front of him, what kind of list it should be. Or Mojang guy, mm -hmm. he just saw it somewhere subconsciously that, wow, if I do this strange you know, box here, you can play it in Minecraft, uh, you know, people are going to most likely like it and want it. And, and the beauty is that 
all around, and especially more in Scandinavia, I think, there are people who have some kind of an internal vision who may not be really good at explaining each other's, but they go their route. And they're going to be, and, and for you too, whenever you have some of these ideas, you're going to be shut down so much. I, I, mean, I, I can tell you, I cannot tell you how many people are bashing my ideas. I, you know, hey, what about this? Uh, you, you, you really, many times, be down there. And I may not be able to explain sometimes, but I know that in about two years, something like this is going to happen over there. Mm -hmm. And I run for the ball where it's going to be, not where it is today. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make sense really to many people. There's maybe like some of the square-headed people, mm -hmm. and I think you all will encounter them. They will ask, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. And they don't know that you're actually running for the ball because it's going to come over there. They can see that because they don't have the intuition mm -hmm. within your discipline, within your field. But you feel that something's going to happen over there. So you start building things. Sometimes you don't, I don't know even why I'm building these things, why I'm creating this structure of these things over there. But intuitively something's going to happen there. So there is some kind of analogy with painters sometimes. If you see painting, somebody's drawing, you know, strange lines there in the middle. And then, ah, now I understand what you're doing. Or Slata, for example, you know, he is so intuitive where the ball is going to come there. So they start running before the ball is there. And I think many entrepreneurs within each one of you have lots of back in the head, intuition about what's going to happen there, and I'll tell you, so here's my point. <laughs> Trust your intuition and go for it. Trust your intuition. Who the fuck is going to tell you that you're wrong? They don't know as much about your thing as you do. The world is full of amateur thinkers out there who want to you know, talk you down and shoot it down, or this is not going to happen. But that's, you know, they are wrong most of the time. Or, having said that, okay, listen to some of their advice. But, <laughs> but, uh, don't take on so much costs in the beginning. We are out there. So that's my second advice. Oh. Did I say that too? Which one was your first? That was it. <laughs> Trust your intuition. Go for it. And with that said, <laughs> those are the questions that we had time for this time. But thank you so much again, Lars Henrik, for, for showing up and coming and spending your time here with us, although we're sick. Uh, <laughs> You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy for it at all. But that's all right, thank you. Thank you.